Welcome to the Cuyahoga Community College Mandel Scholars Thank Academy. You. We are so honored and so appreciative to have you here with us to talk about your path to leadership. Right. I'm going to ask you a few questions and then I'll leave it up to the audience to take away. So, reading about you and just, I just want to say first off, you're an admirable woman. You are so phenomenal. Reading about you, your journey, um, but I'm, I'm going to leave it up to him. Okay, so you received your bachelor's degree from the Conservatory of Music um, at the University of Cincinnati. Correct. What instrument did you play? Um, my primary instrument is piano, but my degree was in music theory and, and composition. And as I often tell people, because with a name like Melody, what else was I going to study in college, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so I studied music because that's the only thing I was interested in studying coming out of high school. Is that still your passion as you pursue your um, you know, passion, that's an interesting word because you hear it a lot, and I'm sure a lot of you hear it. You have to have a passion for it. You know, when I decided to run for the Supreme Court, somebody told me, do it if you have a passion for it, if it got the fire in your belly. But I've never been one of those passion, fire in your belly kind of people. <laughs> so, uh, um, but I still love it immensely. I was. Uh, up until two in the morning trying to figure out some new software and hardware to buy for composing. So it's still a major part of my life. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I play piano myself. All right. Yeah. Great. Yes. All righty. You went to receive your JD from Cleveland Marshall Law School and a PhD from Case Western Reserve University's Cleveland Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. As a Mandel scholar, yes. leadership scholar. Yes. Mm -hmm. What an educational path. I know. So we're kindred spirits here today. Yeah. Can you share with us your educational journey? And if so, what challenges did you face as you pursued your educational career? Um, well, I'm assuming you mean at least from college on. I mm -hmm. don't think we have to go back to high school and grade school. <laughs> um, although there are a couple people in the audience who can talk about my grade school days, but <laughs> I won't go there. Um, uh, you know, I have always endeavored to be a good student. Um, my mother always stressed the importance of, uh, of doing well in school and, and instilled in me young at an early age that it was my job mm -hmm. to do well. I really, she said, you have limited amount of jobs as a, as a, a youngster. You know, keep your room clean, do the dishes, and get good grades. <laughs> and so I figured I could handle that. Um, again, as I stated earlier, I studied music. I majored in music because that's the only thing I was interested in coming out of high school. I did go to, to Beaumont School, which is, I'm sure a lot of people, if not everyone knows here, it's all girls college prep high school. And my mother worked very hard um, working overtime at the post office to pay tuition. Simultaneously in grade school, I started my music studies at the Cleveland Music School Settlement. So I had education there in theory and piano and classical guitar, right. and I was studying at, at school. So it was incumbent upon me to, I knew I was going to college, I just didn't know, I've never known what I wanted to be, and I'm actually still trying to figure out what I want to be really? when I grow up. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, grown. <laughs> and uh, I know I'm actually extra grown at this point <laughs> in my life, but it, it's so it's I never equated study with job or career. Mm -hmm. So I studied, went in and studied music, and you know I remember I got my first report card, and my mother looked at it, and I was pretty proud of it. It was like a 3.4, 3.5, you know, nothing below a B. Mm -hmm. And she looked at it, and she had a puzzling look on her face, and I said, "What's the problem?" I said, "These are good grades." She said. Music theory, physics of sound and music, orchestration, 16th century counterpoint. Do you take any reading and writing classes? <laughs> you know, and I just no, just music. So you know, I, I just I, I I enjoyed it, um, and I never thought about what I was going to be. And I figured once I did my bachelor's degree, I was done. Stick a fork in me. I had completed my <laughs> education, and I was done. Um, but little did I know, um, after about a year of working, mm -hmm. after I got my bachelor's degree, I was intellectually bored. And so I, I promptly took that music degree and got a job in the healthcare industry. <laughs> and I worked at a healthcare management office in Shaker Heights and, and managed that office. And, and it was... Um, okay for employment, but it just wasn't intellectually stimulating. And the vice president of the company was in law school at the time, and he'd sit mm -hmm. his books down and I'd peruse through them. And I just found it fascinating. So on a whim, and I do mean literally on a whim, I applied to law school. 
<laughs> That's extraordinary. <laughs> On a whim, you applied to law school. Well, I, I, let me t let me back up. <laughs> Just so you don't think I'm a total. It was a total fluke. Oh no. Um, my older sister mm -hmm. is a lawyer, was a lawyer at the time. She was in law school at the time I was in high school. And I did call her and I said, I'm thinking about applying to law school, what do you think? And she hesitated and she said, I wouldn't do it if I were you. And so I applied the next day. <laughs> so that's, that's really about the extent of it. And so then, you know, went on and I have to tell you, for three years of law school, there was regular conversation with myself, do I really want to go to law school? Do I really want to be a lawyer? It wasn't that it was, I mean, it was hard and difficult and challenging, but mm -hmm. intellectually stimulating. I just didn't have, like you said, that passion. I, can't, I couldn't imagine myself in the courtroom, although I thought I'd do fine. I knew lawyers, you know, did different things. And, you know, and I remember walking across the stage getting my, you know, fake degree, because, you know, they don't give you your real degree. <laughs> walking across the stage, they mail that yeah. to you, saying, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to want to be a lawyer? I'm absolutely glad that I did. It is, it is um, life altering. It changes your perspective on a lot of things. I could practice law tomorrow if I had to, and if I never practiced law a day in my life again, that would be fine. But the knowledge you have is, is absolutely invaluable. And then fast forward 12 years, uh, maybe we can talk about this later, how I got into the doctoral program at MSAS, because I had been a lawyer for 12 or 13 years, and I had no plans, hear me, no plans <laughs> to go back to school under any circumstances, and yet I found myself in the doctoral program, and again, one of the best decisions I ever made. That's phenomenal. <laughs> just to know that that was just out of the blue, too. <laughs> um, I just want to say congratulations to being the first African-American woman in the Ohio Supreme Court. Elected. 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 Because there was yeah. one appointment. Um, justice, former Justice Yvette McGee Brown was appointed in 2010. And, and did not, she was appointed by Governor Strickland. She ran to keep the seat. She was not successful, making me the first elected, but she was actually the first to serve. First elected. <laughs> Give a round of applause. Thank you. Can you tell us what this means to you personally? to be a, an Ohio Supreme Court Justice? Personally, it means a lot of work, <laughs> is, what it, <laughs> is what it means. Um, you know, the historical significance of uh, being the first black woman elected to the court isn't lost on me mm -hmm. at all, but that's not why I ran for the office. I ran for the office um, to make a positive impact on our justice system as a whole. I thought that my background, having practiced law, um, I was a law professor for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I've published in the law, and then I did the doctoral program. And I was very fortunate in the doctoral program because I was able to do all of my assignments with law-related social science uh, research. And so I, and I've served on various committees at the Supreme Court. I had sat by assignment on the Supreme Court before. And so I just figured I've got some things to offer. Let me try to tell as many people across the state as I could right. and, and then let the chips fall where they may come election day. So, you know, again, the historical significance isn't lost, but I really just kind of focus every day on what can I do and what can my staff do and what can I do with my colleagues at the court to make the justice system in Ohio better. To say the very least, as a young African-American woman mm -hmm. myself, it is such an honor to see that you put us on the charts. Oh. <laughs> We're <laughs> well, there. <laughs> but um, also, to, I mean, it's not every day that you will see someone of your status in, in the highest, at the highest at that in the Supreme Court justice system. Oh, okay. Thank you. I just want to say thank you personally. You're, you're quite welcome. Any, <laughs> anything for you, I will do. <laughs> <laughs> Except run for president. <laughs> You guys hear that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, as a Mandel Leadership Fellow from Case Western Reserve and as a woman of color in a highly visible and powerful position in the state of Ohio, what advice would you offer young women and aspire, young women who aspire to leadership and to women of color? Um, for women in general, and particularly for women of color, you know, we've always, it's, it's all the same challenges I think that men have and, and uh, uh, people in majority populations, but we have also the hurdles of, of, of glass ceilings, of people who look like us not traditionally being in place. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, it's harder for younger people to, I have to tell you, I never um, thought about 
the Ohio Supreme Court in my youth. I never thought about being a lawyer in my youth. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be completely honest and say I really never thought about doing anything in my youth, <laughs> except <laughs> in, 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 except what was what was exactly in front of me. So f my bachelor's degree, it was orchestration and score reading and practicing six hours a day and, mm -hmm. and then I was a resident advisor in the dorm and it was keeping that running. So it was just always right in front of me and, and again I never equate it. Now when I come out with a bachelor's of music degree in theory and composition, what will I do to pay the bills with that degree? I, I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. And I think it got instilled in me early on in life that it's not so much what you do, it's how you do it. Okay. And so I spent a lot of my career, a lot of my jobs, just doing the best that I could. Not so much so, you know, I, I could get accolades, but um, when you do something well, I think people take notice. Right. And then they offer opportunities in, in front of you. I was speaking to a high school class when I was on the campaign trail, and I was telling them, you know, if I were your garbage collector, I'd be the best garbage collector in the, in the department. And a young man said to me, well, what is there to collect in garbage? You just pick up, you throw it in the garbage, you take the truck and you move on. Okay. I said, but the difference is you wouldn't have any garbage on your um, curb or on your sidewalk when you got home. If anything fell out of the truck, it would be picked up. Your garbage can would be upright with the top on it mm -hmm. in its place, not three doors down in Mrs. Jones's house <laughs> or crushed or blowing out in the street. Where, so right. it's just the way you do things. It's, it's, it's not necessarily the manner in which. And I, um, you know, some very dear family friends of mine, uh, Marge and Joe Geiger here, I used to babysit their sons, who are wonderful men in their own right, and I like to think I had something to do with it. But, <laughs> um, but, but likewise, I babysat for them. They have three sons, not much younger than I am. Um, and when they walked out the door, you know, it was just like a kind of a free-for-all. It was like test the babysitter. It was, <laughs> but it was my job to want to have them in bed by the time their parents wanted them in bed. Right. Um, if we made snacks, then it was wash up the dishes, put them back in place so that when they got home, the kids were in bed, the house was in order, and everything, you know, was fine. And so that's just kind of how I do everything. And you learn how it, things should be done, and you want it done, and if you can offer a suggestion to make it better, then you do that. So that's just how I do everything. And I often say I don't do my job as a Supreme Court Justice much different than I did as a babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> it's just just di different skill set. So yeah. you take it a day at a time. I, I do. I take it. I take the job a day at a time, and I look forward to seeing what's on the horizon okay. to see if there's some sea change coming on, something we need to concentrate on to change down the way. I mean, the job of the Supreme Court, just so you all know, if you're not as familiar with it. Um, you know, the Supreme Court of Ohio, not all cases can get there. We only take cases in that are of great significance to the state of Ohio. But that sitting on the bench deciding those cases is just a small part of our job. We are also responsible for the discipline of all lawyers and judges across the state when some, some misconduct happens. Mm -hmm. We have various committees that look at rule changes and task force to look at the way we do things in Ohio. Um, we are the gatekeepers for, for bar, for admission to the bar, so approving bar exams applicants and and um, you know, ruling on uh, exemptions to certain rules we have a huge staff at the Supreme Court over 250 people um, so it's 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 a it's an overall management management of the justice system in Ohio mm -hmm. plus deciding cases and controversy right so right. it's 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 you look at the whole picture and you figure out what's coming up where we can do something preemptive to make it better and then you try to you know keep the wheels of justice going rather relatively smoothly Smooth. all right thank you sure Yep. Try not to make these answers too long-winded, but I think I am uh, to some degree. No, it's perfectly yeah, okay. fine. You're doing okay. great. All right. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Do you have a vision for our future here in Ohio? As you, you know, as you said, stated that you're in the, you take everything one day at a time. Mm -hmm. So, what is it that you have for young, young students like me mm -hmm. to pursue my dream, basically, or for the state of Ohio? Well, first of all, I am expecting you and your generation to mm -hmm. save the world. No pressure. But, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I am sometimes um, disappointed, and maybe that's too strong a word, at how little power you think you have. I mean, mm, the government okay. really belongs to the people. 
in, in all elected offices, be it the Supreme Court, your council person, your school board, Congress. Um, and I think over time, we, primarily my generation above, we have allowed elected officials to go about their day-to-day -day work without keeping um, us in mind, without keeping in mind who they serve. For me, elected officials okay. should be there to serve the people in their community, and when they least lose sight of that, they really should think about vacating the position because right. it's, it's not about the individual. And so we don't seem to demand um, that sort of public service. And I'm not talking about, you know, philosophical differences or political differences. We're going to have those mm -hmm. and we have to agree to disagree and we have to move on and make a decision that's best for the community. And I think we as a, as a people, as citizens of Ohio and a, as a nation, we don't require more and we don't demand more and thus I think um, the, the, the quality of that sort of representation and public serving has has diminished a bit over time. That's truly sad. It and is. I so it is your responsibility to, 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 to make that. I mean, you know, you hold your elected officials accountable. And we have to be willing to say that and not say, well, yes, I don't think what he or she did was, was right, but, you know, he or she belongs to my political party, or he or she is, you know, uh, he's, a fe he's a male or she's a female or, you know, he's white or she's black. And, you know, we've got to be willing to relinquish that um, to be better, but we have to do it as a group because I think we fear, you know, if political party A is not going to do it because they don't think political party B is going to do it. And so everybody is, you know, digging their feet in and just keeping the status quo and I think we're suffering as a, as a community. I feel like as, um, as a young student and I never knew much about government work or mm -hmm. anything of that sort, it's kind of scary sometimes to think, well, what should I do? Do I really understand their language? Like, what is it, what is my impact on you being elected or someone else being elected or not being elected into, you know, the office? Mm -hmm. How, like, how do we start outside of coursework to gain knowledge about what it is that you're doing and what it is someone else is doing and if they're being truthful to their work? Yeah, that, that's a, actually a, a very good question. I often encourage people who think they want to go into elected office, be it local, you know, community, county, statewide, or even at the federal level, to find out what those people do. It, it can be as simple as, I mean, there are some council members across the state who are below the age of 25. And, and, and some people run for election because it's an open position and they think they can or they need a job or they want a good public pension. Mm -hmm. But find out what it is that that particular office does and then see if your skill set matches it. I think a, um, I thought one of the reasons why I would be a good Supreme Court justice, not just, you know, my, my own cultural diversity, but, you know, my background, you know, mm -hmm. the music background, the, the social science studies in, um, from the Mandel School, that, that wasn't there on the court. Um, yes, there had been some former appellate court judges who are on the court like I am. And so I think if you bring a skill set that is complementary to what's already there or that adds to what's already there, okay. as opposed to running for an office and learning on the job. And that's going to council meetings or going to school board meetings and understanding, you know, how to, to draft the legislation and the ordinances and what the charter means. And what is what does your community need? And you might want to start off small as a state rep or a council person. What is your community lacking that you can get, that, that it needs, and, and as opposed to just going by names, or I recognize that name, or this person has been a long time elected official, we might as well let him or her keep the job. Um, and then, you know, again, I never thought about being a Supreme Court justice. Right. It's just something that came up. I've been asked three times to run for the Supreme Court prior to this last run, and it just never seemed like either the right time or I was still learning more about being a Court of Appeals judge um, doing that, or um, so it's, it, and it's never really been about me. It's really mm -hmm. been about, um, about the timing and, and, and what I think I'd have to offer and the composition of the court as it existed. So um, I, I don't even know that you have to know what it is you want to do and what it is you want to want to be in life. Um, I think as you traverse and you do different things and you find yourself in, in places of responsibility, you learn while you're there. Um, I, I, I have to tell you, I, mm -hmm. I've never, at, at your age, at this point in life, 
I don't think I ever had a Supreme Court justice in the room. I don't even think I ever was in a room with a judge. <laughs> you know, unless, of course, it was a speeding ticket. Right? <laughs> um, so uh, that wasn't, I'd never aspired to be on the bench or to be a judicial officer or an elected officer. But I found my say, myself in, in 2017, in 2018, at a point in life where I had been reelected twice without opposition to the Court of Appeals. I had done that work. In my mind, I had, I had pretty much mastered it. Mm -hmm. um, and was I needed somewhere else? And I've got to tell you, running for that race, as grueling as it was, I was OK with the outcome. Whether if I had lost the race, and I shouldn't say lose because I really don't feel it would have been a loss. Had I not been successful in the election or won the election, then I would have remained on the Court of Appeals here in Cuyahoga County. I would have been an appellate court judge. And, and that was fine with me because I was very trustful and, and faithful to I would be wherever it was I was supposed to be. Right. And, and also, too, I often tell students, and, and be aware of that for what some things that you think is rejection, sometimes is really redirection. I ran for the Court of Appeals in 2000, and I was not successful. And I don't watch election results. Um, I just, I usually, I just go to bed, because you can't change them, with the exception <laughs> of when President Obama was elected. I did watch those <laughs> results. But I, I, you know, I, I went to bed, and I wasn't successful in 2000. Now, I have to tell you, judicial terms are six years. So had I won in 2000, I would have run for re-election in 2006, and then run for re-election in 2012, then been up for re-election in 2018. Now, you can't run for two judicial seats. So had I won in 2000 at the Court of Appeals, I would have made the hard decision, I would have been faced with the hard decision of, do I run to retain my seat on the Court of Appeals in 2018, or do I run statewide, first, and I would have run unopposed, no competition whatsoever, or do I run an opposed race against an incumbent where somebody who looks like me has never, ever been, been elected to, not only am I the first African-American male elected to the, uh, female elected to the, I really am a female. <laughs> not, not only am I the first African-American female elected to the Ohio Supreme Court, mm -hmm. I'm the first African-American Democrat or Democrat of color ever elected to any statewide office in the history of this state. Wow. So it, it's, it, thank you. And I, and I didn't find that out until after I got, or I didn't realize that until after I got elected. So. If I had to choose between running for re-election and a safe seat where I was a shoe-in to get my job back, or run for a job where I had a long shot, mm -hmm. what would I have done? Run for the long shot. You think? No. Wrong answer. <laughs> You're on I got to tell you, and I hate to disappoint you, but there is, there is I'm 99% sure I would not have run from lack of cover is what we call it. You know, you run, you judges run, when you hear them say we're running from cover or running for safety, that means if you lose, you still have your job. If I had run for 2018, if I had won 16 and hit, came up for re-election, mm -hmm. and I'd give up my seat to run for a long shot, I probably would not have given up my seat. You're a go-getter. So, so see, and, but in 2000, would I have known that? Would I have known that I was supposed to lose the race in 2000 to be eligible for the Supreme Court in 2018? Mm -hmm. There was no way for me to know that. So, I, so sometimes, you know, your, your, what seems like rejection, I think, is sometimes just redirection. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What is it that you feel that you can offer our community in Ohio? You, you said mm -hmm. it multiple times that, you know, you're willing, it's what you're willing to offer. Um, what is it that you think will make our community better? What is it that you can give for us as a younger generation? Well, one thing is, um, you know, when we're in conference in the cases, and it's just, you know, the seven justices, and we're talking about cases, immediately, the very, very first week on the bench, and back in um, 2019, beginning of last year, mm -hmm. my perspective is different. So I was raised here in the city of Cleveland in a single mother household um, in the uh, inner city of Cleveland and later moved out to East Cleveland. Um, my mother wasn't formally educated. As a matter of fact, she grew up in the segregated South, where the black schools only went to the eighth grade. And I never knew that my mother didn't even have a high school uh, diploma until after she died. And I found her um, GED equivalency uh, uh, certificate in her belongings. Wow. And she got that one year before I finished college, when she was in her 60s. 
And, and the reason why I didn't know that is because my mother was well read. Mm -hmm. So she read things, she wrote poetry. Um, I remember being eight or nine years old and, sh and we're looking at the newspaper and she's showing me the, the um, uh, stock market symbols for certain stock. Mm -hmm. um, she helped people with her taxes. She acted at Caramoo Theater. And so I didn't know that my mother um, lacked so much of a formal education. And sure, there was music in our house. She was, we listened to the Motown sound and Aretha Franklin, mm -hmm. but we also listened to Bach and Beethoven and Chopin. Yeah. And I have to tell you, I did close my ears a lot when I was a kid, <laughs> but slowly I started putting my hand down and, oh, I like that, that piano. So I like that orchestration. And, and, so, and that probably you know, was a beginning to my music career. And so the perspective is different that I bring. I can sit in my conference with my colleagues, and we had a case earlier in the year where a young African-American man was stopped. Um, police were responding to a domestic uh, violence call, and suddenly mm -hmm. they heard gunshots in the distance. So and they immediately left that call and mm -hmm. went searching for the gunshots, which we would want our law enforcement officers to do. They came around a the corner. They saw a young man walking across the street, not running, not you know, suspicious, talking on the cell phone. They jumped out of their car, guns drawn, and asked him if he heard gunshots. He said, yeah, I think I heard them coming from over there. And they started patting him down and asking him if he had any weapons on him. He said, yeah, I have a gun in my, in my jacket pocket here. So they confiscated the gun, and he didn't have a permit to carry the gun. So they charged him with carrying a concealed weapon, you know, and he mm -hmm. didn't have a license. So he moved to suppress that saying, hey, you didn't even have any probable cause or any reason to search me. I'm walking down the street minding my business. Right. And um, he moved to suppress it. The trial court said, no, we're going to let it go. So he pled, uh, he pled um, no contest and then appealed it. The Court of Appeals in Franklin County reversed it, saying you violated his Fourth Amendment rights. There was nothing he was doing where you had a reasonable suspicion that he was committing a crime. Right. He was simply walking, down, crossing the street on his phone. But we decided, so it came to our court, and the majority of members on our court voted to reverse the Court of Appeals and say, yes, the, the police officers were responding to guns, shot, that was an emergency. In other words, it was okay for them to stop him and search him, and so they let the conviction stand. I wrote a dissenting opinion, and in that conference, and, and I would, I'll never say what, what my colleagues say in conference, I think you know our conferences are sacrosanct, mm -hmm. but I don't ever mind saying what I said. Um, I said to all of my colleagues, if any of us had been that guy walking down the street, mm -hmm. none of us would have been stopped. I said, including me, as a woman. Right. But because he was an African American male, he was stopped and he was frisked. And there was nothing that gave sign. He didn't look at them and turn the other direction. There was no furtive movement. He didn't start running. Just there was walking. nothing to indicate that he had committed a crime. And so I think his, his rights were violated. Mm -hmm. And so I get to say that in, in, my, in, in the um, setting of our conferences. Could some other justices say that too? Sure, they could. Um, I just think my perspective is different. Mm -hmm. And so even when I'm not in the majority on the decisions, I have the power of the pen. And so I can continue writing about those things. And it gets published, and it's out there forever. Also, I get to, um, I'm only one of two people in our entire building uh, of color that has law degrees. And so it's an entree to, to give people more opportunity. And maybe because I'm there, people will be more inclined to apply for a clerkship with me or an externship with me. And, mm -hmm. and so it's just, and then my work ethic is just such that I just always look at things to be corrected. We've had some rule changes that have taken place that I was lobbying for all the time when I was a lawyer or a judge um, um, that now that I'm sitting as a justice get changed just like that. So it's, it's. Um, that's my job to, to do that, and, and I feel that that I'm making those sort of that sort of headway. Bringing justice to everyone, pretty much. Trying to. You're doing a great job. Well, thank that you. was a great story, by the way. Too. Okay, State versus Harrison is the case. In case anybody wants to read it. And by the way, too, all of our hearings are live streamed, so you can watch us anytime you want on um, OhioChannel.org. Um, we we have we have hearings on Tuesdays and, and Wednesday mornings not of every week, and so they are set forth um, on, our, on our website. But they're also archived. So if there's any particular case that comes up that you think you might want to 
hear about or if it involves a matter that you're interested in, you can always go back and, and listen to it. And then, of course, you can come down to Columbus and hear us live, too. So if you ever come down, you can let me know, and if I can, I'll take you to lunch or something. Sounds like you strive for knowledge. Oh, yeah. All the time. I, I, yeah. I, you know, nobody can be all knowing, but right. I am always, always um, learning about stuff. On my drives back and forth to Columbus, I'm always listening to audiobooks. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the only way I can digest reading that's not case reading. I always have my brief, briefcase with me. Um, so if I'm sitting in a waiting room, I, I had a friend whose mom is uh, in the hospital and I was there with her all day yesterday and I was there reading briefs and, and doing cases. And so, yes, because the more we know, the, the, the better. More, right. Yeah, the, the better we are. Um, and, and most of the time, things that happen in our society, in our community, it's just because people don't know better. Right. You know, when you know better, you, you, you do better. Um, I remember my first time I threw a, a piece of paper on the ground walking with my mother, a candy wrapper opened up, tsh, candy wrapper hit the ground. My mother saw it <laughs> and she said, go pick that candy wrapper <laughs> up. And I said, I don't need it. I think I was probably four or five. I said, I don't need it. And she said, the ground is not your garbage can, though. And I right. said, well, what am I supposed to do with it? She said, put it in your pocket till you get home. I said, I don't have a pocket. I was determined to win this argument, mind you. <laughs> she, I said, I don't have a pocket. She said, then pick it up and give it to me. The ground is not your cra trash can. You know, that's how litter, and then we went on and learned that. To this day, I despise litter so bad <laughs> that if I see someone throw something out of their car window, I sometimes pull up next to them and stop and say something. I have learned how to say it <clears throat> so that I can move from the light. But, but that was an instance where had I not been checked, had my mm -hmm. mother not told me then, I probably would have gone on and became an adult who littered. And so when you know better, you do better. And I think we have to keep, we have to remember that things that are our values and the things we try to do to help in society, recycling, littering, mm -hmm. just things like that. Not everybody has an awareness of that. Okay. Um, because crisscrossing the state, um, campaigning, I saw some of the poorest communities in Ohio that we probably have, yet they weren't littered. There were people whose houses were almost looked like they were falling apart, but they were swept up and had a chair on the front, and their front yard had no garbage in it, and cars weren't sitting, you know, on blocks and things. So th there is there is a sense of of, of pride in, in what you have, and for me and how I grew up, that transcended. The only houses I have ever owned are the houses I have purchased. You know, we rented, we lived in apartments when I was younger, but. They always look better than they did before we got there when we left. And my mother said, it's not only get your deposit back, she said, but we might not own it, but it is our home. Right. So you're supposed to keep it a certain way. You're supposed to keep and those, it so those are the things that I just learned that just permeate my everyday life. That's well, I'm, I'm lost for words. Don't um. be lost for words. And, and it, you can, you know, it goes with everything. It's, it's how you do anything. It's how you live. It's where you live. It's how you work. It's how you interact with people. You know. So it, upkeeping and staying in school and just knowledge. And I, I said to a group of students once, you know, college might not be for everybody. I know I'm not supposed to say that here, but you know, college might not be for everybody, but knowledge is absolutely for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's knowledge of how to be an entrepreneur, if it's knowledge of, of some uh, technical or trade skills, um, I often tell people, you know, if I don't do my job for about a month or, or two, it's not going to affect you or most people. Let your garbage man not pick up for a month or two and see what happens. You know, let the line workers for electricity when it goes down not get up and get your electricity back up and see how that affects you. So, mm -hmm. so you know, everything we do, it, it, again, it's how you do it. And, and so I, I'm, I'm, although I'm very, you know, pleased and humbled when places and organizations like yours offer to have me here to, to hear about, you know, me and being on the Supreme Court, it's, it's, it's just a story of, of my life, and this is another chapter of my life and, and, and how it goes. And so, I, again, not aspiring to be here, mm -hmm. I think when you do things a certain way, then those opportunities present themselves for you. You don't even have to see them now, but they will come along in each path of your life. Okay. So I promise. Connect, connecting mm -hmm. to the public, the general public, and to students as well, how do you stay connected with your voters to become reelected and to inform others of what it is we need to know. Yeah, that's that's an interesting task because it varies 
depending on what your who your constituency is. Um, uh, mine obviously is statewide, and my goal was to get to all. You know how many counties we have in the state? It's a student. Anybody? Student. No faculty. No teachers. <laughs> Students. Anybody know how many counties in Ohio? Wow, Probably really? over like 100. Somebody said over 100. Not quite. No. Wait a minute. Some class, what do you mean? <laughs> Tri-C doesn't teach. There are 88 counties in Ohio, which was real appropriate since I was a pianist, right? 88 keys, 88 <laughs> counties, you know. <clears throat> 88 counties in the state. The state is huge. I would travel so far west sometimes, I could swear I was in Indiana. So far east and south, I could swear I was in West Virginia. And so my goal was to get to all 88, well, 87, because I obviously live here in Cuyahoga. So my goal was to get to the all 87 counties. And my campaign manager kept saying, you don't have to get to all 87. I said, but I want to get to all 87. You don't have to get to all 87. I ended up getting to 62 other counties. Um, so I didn't get them all. It's impossible statewide to touch and concern everybody you know, in the state. I think it's, it was difficult running for the Court of Appeals. Cuyahoga is a large county, and so you couldn't touch and concern everybody. But if you're running for your local um, city council, small, a smaller community, Orange, Beachwood, you know, Parma, Brexville, you could probably get to a lot of people, your ward in the city of Cleveland, your school board. And so that you can, and then there are forums that are available and, and candidates nights that people come out and you can do, and then you send out literature and then you do social media. So I had a strong social media group. Um, I went to everything from pancake breakfasts to fish fries to carnivals and festivals and, you know, everywhere where two or more voters were, there was I, you know, to the extent I could be. And you just talk about who you are as a candidate, but let me say this, and I'll end the answer to this question. I had as a goal running statewide to try to tell as many people across the state what our judicial system is because a lot of non-lawyers don't know, uh, you know, and, and I understand that. So I would crisscross the state after saying who I was and why I was running, mm -hmm. explaining the differences between our municipal courts and our common pleas courts and our court of appeals and our Supreme Courts. You know, our trial courts are what you all are probably more exposed to. That's what we see on TV. That's with juries. That's where, you know, people are fighting it out and objections, sustain and all that, the drama. That's at the trial court level, at the municipal courts and primarily at the common pleas courts, which deals with high level felonies and, and those sort of things. You have an appeal as a matter of right from any decision from a trial court to the court of appeals. Which And here in Cuyahoga County, we have the 8th District Court of Appeals. There are 12 appellate districts in the state of Ohio. Three of those appellate courts are single county appellate courts, obviously our bigger cities, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Cuyahoga, Franklin, Hamilton counties, single district court of appeals. So those nine other appellate districts make up the other 85 counties. One appellate district has 17 counties in it. Wow. But they're small counties. There's, some of them are, are smaller than some of our cities here in, in, in Coyote County. So you have an appeal as a matter of right. Traffic ticket, termination of parental rights, <coughs> planning and zoning decision, murder conviction, um, um, uh, will contest. Anything you think went wrong at the trial court, you have an absolute right to appeal, period. You don't have that right at the Ohio Supreme Court. Again, we only take cases that are of great importance. We take, other than some direct appeals that we have to take, like death penalty cases mm -hmm. and some um, public utilities appeals, we might review oh, 50 to 70 cases every other week to try to get in the court. Sometimes we don't vote any of them in. We accept probably less than 5% of cases who try to get into our court because we are not an error-correcting court. And I know that sounds strange. But there's no way for the seven of us to hear everything that you think is error that happened at the media, intermediate level court of appeals. So often, the court of appeals is the court of really last resort for you. And that's why it's important mm, to even look okay. at those judges. Because you can get into that court. You have a okay. right to get in that court. You don't have a right to get into the Supreme Court. So my goal on the campaign trail was to do what I just did here, educate you all about the courts. Because also during election time, there is huge drop-off for those people who vote, 
there are huge drop-offs when you get to the judges. You know who's running for governor. You know who's running for president. You know who's running for your local city council most of the time. Those things, the mayor. But when you get to the judges, especially in the even number years, because even number years are county, state, and federal elections, um, although federal judges aren't elected, they're appointed. But in even number of years, in Cuyahoga County or counties as large as we are, you might have 24 judges, judicial races on your ballot, and you go, whoa, that's too many, and you just skip them. So it was part of educating the public so that people are more inclined to look on websites or look into what the candidates are and vote, and vote in judicial races. So that way, even if I did not win the election, we would have had, in my opinion, a more educated state population on what the judiciary does. And that would have been a win for me. So I fortunately I did that and then won the race. I think as a, as a young woman and a woman of color, it is very important to know what I have as a right in our judicial system. Oh, yeah. And, and because... Right. Citizens. All of you. And people don't know that. And you have an absolute right to represent yourself. I know all the lawyers are probably shrugging. Oh, don't say that. But, you know, cost of legal services are expensive. And that's another one of our problems in the state, access to, to the justice system. So many people can't afford lawyers. Right. And so, um, yeah, so the more, so again, being more informed about that and being more knowledgeable um, makes people, um, uh, gives them a stronger fortitude, gives them more options, and is just make better life decisions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> what has been your most rewarding accomplishment throughout mm. your career as a Supreme Court Justice? Let's see. So today is what, January the 16th? Yes. <clears throat> so I've been a Supreme Court Justice one year and two weeks. Um, and in that one year, two weeks, um, interesting from a technical standpoint, and boy, if my colleagues see this, I might get it, but <laughs> so at the end of the year, December 31st of 2019, from a technical standpoint, um, we are randomly assigned to author cases, and I'm going to tell you this high-tech way we do this. Um, we all sit as a court. After cases are heard, we go in the conference room. We discuss cases by seniority. So the Chief Justice starts talking first. Nobody interrupts her. Um, and by the way, the Chief Justice on our court is the first and only woman to be Chief Justice um, in the state of Ohio, only woman Chief Justice. Then the next senior justice talks, then the next senior justice, then the next. We sit by seniority on the bench, and we talk by seniority in conference. So being the least senior justice on the court, because one justice is one day senior to me, um, um, I get to talk last after hearing what everyone else has said. Mm -hmm. And then we take a vote. And so the vote might be 7-0 unanimous to reverse it or affirm it. It might be 6-1-5-2-4-3. The majority has numbers, one through seven, on little marbles that go into a rubber bottle. <laughs> And so let's say we vote on a case and justices one, three, four, and five are in the majority. One, three, four, and five marbles are put into a bottle. One justice shakes the bottle up, turns his head, pours out the number <laughs> in another justice's hand, and that justice says, lucky number four. And that's who writes the opinion. So that is the high-tech wow. way <laughs> that we decide opinions. It's completely random like that, random to the extent that you have to put at least the people in the majority in the bottle. Um, and so at the end, we measure each time we have a conference how many uh, authoring opinions you've got left on the docket that, you know, from the year. As of December 31st, and we measure by six weeks or older, at, by the end of last year, I did not have a single solitary case on my watch that I'm authoring that had not already been circulated. And I was only justice to have that. All my other colleagues had between three and 12 pending. I had none. So I'd like to think I'm the more efficient justice. <laughs> on the court. So hopefully they don't see this. <laughs> <laughs> Who are your role models, your judicial role models, and what inspired you to become where you are today? Well, um, judicial role models, you know, I, I'm not sure that I have any or have one in particular. I have read the opinions of various Supreme Court justices, state and federal, mm -hmm. over the years, predominantly federal um, justices. Um, individually and personally, you know, I've got to say, 
uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who I had the pleasure of meeting this summer, um, who just never ceases to amaze me mm -hmm. about how sharp her mind still is and, and um, battling, battling her, her health issues. But just being a, a, such a, a clear and present voice is, is what I've admired most about her. Mm -hmm. And I have to, to say, I'm a bit embarrassed that I didn't know just how instrumental she and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman on the uh, House, I mean on the U.S. Supreme Court, were. And there's a book called Sisters in Law, for those of you who are interested, that I read several years ago. And it's a book about the life of uh, Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And it's, it's, it's amazing how much um, they contributed to the jurisprudence in this country and the way women are treated in, in all sectors, in the workforce, and et cetera. So, you know, I've got to say that's, that's kind of, I'm, I don't get starstruck that much. I got to tell you, when I met her, I got a little speechless and I, I said, and I, you know, she's the type, she always wears gloves and at this meeting she didn't have on gloves and she had a health bout and I wasn't going to come too near her, but I was brought over to meet her and introduced at Supreme Court Justice Ohio. And so I was just going to wave to her and say, hi, you know, nice to meet you. And she extended her hand and said, very nice to meet you. And so she shook my hand and I, Walked around like this for a while, but, <laughs> other than that. But but there there are some pretty amazing jurists in this state, actually. Um, uh, you know, trial at the trial court and appellate court level, and uh, um, and I just I just I, I applaud their work and I appreciate their work too. We appreciate yours. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Um, can you tell me how you balance your career life aside from your family life, with all the work that you do? in the court, mm -hmm. how are you able to have well, free time? <laughs> I don't sleep that much. And, and I, I say that, but it's actually <laughs> true. Um, I think it started in college. In my last quarter of college, um, I had to take 12 courses in order to graduate in four years, and I did not want to come back after that quarter. So I took four classes. I mean, I took um, 12 classes. I was the head resident advisor for a 475 woman dorm, and I supervised the desk clerk staff. And this is obviously long before computers, internet, and all that sort of stuff. And so I only slept on Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and either Friday, either Thursday or Friday. So I only slept about four nights a week in that last quarter in order to get through that quarter. That's all I could afford to sleep. Um, and unfortunately then that carried over in law school and it carried over in the doctoral program. So mm -hmm. generally I only get between three to five hours of sleep a night and on the campaign trail it was two to four hours of sleep a night. Wow. My Fitbit told me I got an hour and 45 minutes sleep last night you know, just because just cause life. Now I know a lot of people can't function on that. I have friends who tell me all the time I would be in a haze. <laughs> <clears throat> and I know as I get older, it's not good for me, and I'm trying to get more sleep. There are just not enough hours in the day. And I make it a priority to be present in the lives of my friends and family, too, because mm -hmm. I think it's important for me, and, you know, and it's important for them. I and mean, Lisa seems to be. And I don't want to change a lot of, of, I don't want to change at all of who I am as a person just right. because I have a different job and a different title. Right. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I, I don't. You know, after I leave here today, I'm taking my brother out to dinner for his birthday because his birthday was Sunday. And, and this is just how I know my siblings. So his birthday was Sunday. I offered to take him to dinner Sunday. But there were two NFL playoff games on, <laughs> so I knew he'd say no. <laughs> so we, we set it for today. But, you know, it's, it's important. It's um, you know, I can't be all work and nobody can be. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to prioritize that aspect of my life with my professional life, um, but I just, I don't sleep much. Unfortunately, this is a job where I can do it um, 90, 90 to 95% of it I can do okay. any time of the day. So I can read briefs at three in the morning. I can send emails, you know, all time of night. So other than being in Columbus on the bench, I can take my job anywhere. Any piano in between? Yeah, that's that's a little sensitive subject. Um, 
I have not played in quite some time. And for any of you who play instrument, you know, when you don't play for a while, you, you a lose. A little rusty. You lose, oh, a little rusty. So, <laughs> um, and and I, have, I have composed more. Um, matter of fact, I, I did uh, contributed music to a, a short film, an independent film, that was nominated in the um, LA Film Festival a while back. Um, and so that's more interesting to me because, matter of fact, I might have to take a class at Tri-C on that because it's so fascinating with all the technology and the programming and the computer stuff. And so it doesn't require the same skill set. Playing requires this and it requires facilitation here. Right. Composing just requires this. So I try to do more composing than I do playing, although I have agreed to, to do a performance next year that I will start preparing for soon. Gotta get to it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no pressure, thank you. <laughs> all right, I believe that is all I have for you okay. today. I really appreciate it. Sitting beside me, I'm so excited. I'm still She's a little still speechless. Excited? <laughs> I'm very excited. <laughs> um, I just wanna say it takes courage to be exceptional and to be so knowledgeable and to actually go out for your dreams. It's been a great honor sitting here next to you, of course, and to speak here with all of you uh, guests and Mandel scholars. Thank you. Thank you. I can't imagine anybody has any questions we didn't answer. Yes, huh? I, I was, I was going to get there. <laughs> Is there any questions from the audiences that you have for? Oh, she's like, I got the mic. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, I know you spoke about making changes and getting them done rapidly, but is there one amongst uh, many issues the system, justice system may have, is there one issue that you wish to change and have faced a lot of adversity trying to get that change implemented? Um, there are so many important, I think, things what we can do to make our, our justice system better. Um, and when I say justice system, I primarily mean criminal justice, but still it's just access to justice. I mean, uh, we need to do things as a court, Supreme Court and particularly trial courts, we need to do better, in my opinion, on those. We need to respect the fact that all people's time is valuable. People shouldn't have to lose their jobs because they're waiting in court too long for a hearing or have to continually come back for things. And the fact that we're, we're the only shop in town isn't a good enough reason uh, to subject people to what I think are unnecessary delays and waiting in time. You know, we're looking at bail bond reform at, at the Supreme Court level now. Um, you know, we are a system of innocent until proven guilty. And so therefore, for pre-hearing or pre-trial detention, again, you shouldn't have to lose your house or lose your apartment or lose your family or lose your job because you can't make bail. And you know, so if you're suspected of doing a crime, let's say you're suspected, suspected of, of assault, felony assault. If you're wealthy, you can get out on bail and go on with your life until your trial comes. If you're struggling to make ends meet, I don't care what that bail amount is, you can't get out. And so the consequences for you are, are much more dire, yet you're charged with the same thing. The only difference is somebody's got the money to get out and you don't. So those are the sort of things that, that we have to do. And as part of my doctoral work um, at, at MSAS, at the Mandel School, I think we need a more restorative form of justice. Once you've paid your debt to society and you're not incarcerated for life or sentenced to death, which are the two things where you, know, you, you won't come out, the vast majority of people who are incarcerated are going to come back out. They are going to be back in our society. So what would we rather have, them reintegrated in our society, tax-paying citizens, good neighbors, or do we want them to re-victimize us again? And so the way our system is set up, we need to be more restorative so that people can go on and have productive lives and not be a statistic. So those are just a few of what I think are, are, are many things we, we can do better. I have one more question. Oh, okay. She's like, is I got the mic, and you, you, you might want to it, circulate that. my turn. <laughs> yeah. Is there uh, one issue that you voted for that other people, like that your uh, party, your group, that you wanted, but everybody else voted against, and how did you 
take that moment. When you say my, a, my party, do you mean the other justices on the court? Yes. Okay. All right. And so there's just, you know this too, there's seven justices on the Supreme Court of Ohio. There's the chief, and then there's six associate justices, mm -hmm. and, and I'm um, one of the six. Um, yes, there have been things where I have been in the lone minority mm -hmm. voting for, mm -hmm. and I have no problem with that whatsoever. Okay, so you've never changed how you felt because you were outvoted? I never change how I feel about anything. Mm -hmm. However, have I changed a vote on some matters? Yes, I have, such that there is a better consensus. Remember, when, when we speak, when the Ohio Supreme Court speaks, that's the law for all of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And when we speak with a unified, unified voice, or at least closer to a unified voice, it is a stronger opinion. So when we make decision 7-0 and we all sign on to an opinion, that speaks volumes more so than a 4-3 opinion, or an opinion that has four votes on it, and one might concur in judgment only, meaning they concur in the outcome, but not in the whole opinion. And there might be two or three other opinions, and you know, another concurring opinion. I think this is right, but for this reason, not that reason. I think they're all crazy, and this one is wrong, and this is why. So when we've got those splintered opinions, it, it doesn't guide the judiciary better. So have there been times when I have changed a vote to make an opinion stronger? It is, but if I've got a firm conviction about something, no, I won't change my vote and I'm fine with it. Thank okay. you. You're welcome, honey. So my name is Sadi, and Sadi. I'm also a Mandel Scholar, and Great. it is an honor for us to have you here. Thank I you. also have two questions. All right. Um, the, my first question is, did you have a mentor when you were in your early, um, when you were a graduate student or even when you went to law school that kind of helped you figure out certain stuff? And my second question is, you talk, you know, you were at the Mandel School, mm -hmm. and how did that help you become who you are, and what does the word humanities mean to you? Um, first question is, uh, did I have a mentor? I have had many mentors over my life, some formally in a, in a mentoring program, and, and some just unofficial, just people who um, is work that you see that you emulate, or people who are willing to just stop and take the time, and it could be a five-minute conversation, or it could help you guide through something. And, and I encourage all of you to be mentees and be mentors. You know more than a lot of people in your lives, but there are a lot of people who know more about certain things that are in your lives too. You know, feel free to go to them and, and, and question uh, and, and you know question things and learn more about them. I always say it's okay that you don't know the answer to a question because we are not all knowing, but it's not okay to continue not to know the answer to a question. You know, especially in your generation, all you guys do is take out your electronic device and you know, plug it in. And so, and sometimes, and, and, and you know what's also were, were great teachers to me? Having people talk to me or try to mentor me or people whose interactions or the way they operated and worked um, I thought was not good. And so it taught me how not to be also. And I think you should be observant of those things. Um, and the second question, the Mandel School, listen, the doctoral program was another program that kind of fell on my lap where I had no intention of going back to school. And I did so, and I will say this, and again, things happen the way they're supposed to. At that point in my life, my mother had gotten pretty ill with a neurological disease. And I wanted to be out of the workforce so I could spend more time with her and in her, in, in, in caring for her. This program came up. The Mandel Leadership um, Program was formulated. Someone at the Mandel School recommended that I apply for it. And I said, do you know what I do for a living? I'm a lawyer. I'm not going back to school. Um, but I ended up applying for it because it allowed me to step out of the workforce for about a year, spend more time with my mother, um, who, who died six months later, so it was a great blessing. And, and then, and it was interesting too, because um, you know, going back to school after your working and career, it's, you know, life gets in the way of school, school gets in the way of work, work gets in the way of life. It's, it is a struggle, and I defended my dissertation while I was a Court of Appeals judge. That's just how long it took me between doing the, the coursework and, uh, um, and defending the dissertation. But the main thing that that program in social science and humanities taught me, it was how to ask the right questions. 
and it was instrumental in that. And so um, I am grateful to that program, the, the coursework, the faculty there, and just that way of thinking and recognizing that we all have our own implicit biases about everything, all of us. There isn't a single solitary person that doesn't walk around through life with some sort of biases. And so it helps me to check those, put those in check more so. And again, most importantly, to ask the right questions because there's, there are oftentimes we see things a certain way, but if we ask a few more questions, we will see that it's not necessarily that way. Sure. Behind. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for uh, taking the time to come to the uh, Mandel Center today. My pleasure. Uh, and I wanted to ask, have you ever gone into a uh, case or proceeding with an idea already in mind about it? And then as the, it went on, you had those uh, beliefs uh, challenged or changed. And do you have any advice about overcoming our predisposition, predispositions? Um, in answer to your first question, yes, absolutely. As an appellate court judge and on the Supreme Court, you know, before we go on the bench to hear a case, we've read briefs, um, the briefs, the, the written works that each side submits. Sometimes there's also uh, an amici brief, amici briefs or amicus curiae briefs where there's some organization who's not a party to the case but who has an interest in the case. They will send us briefs and argue for one side or the other. <clears throat> I have, um, each justice has three law clerks or judicial attorneys that work directly with the justice. The chief has four. Uh, I d divvy up all my cases and everything I have into threes such that each law clerk is working on something simultaneously with me so that um, I have always another set of eyes looking at my work. And sometimes things are, are gray areas for me and I am, as you probably well guess, having been a music major, I am more of an, uh, an auditory learner, I'm, I'm an aural learner. I like hearing, not that I don't understand what I read, don't, don't get me wrong, but there have been times when I will read a case and I have in mind something certain, and then after listening to the lawyers argue, I have changed my position on that. So yes, I've done that. And your second question, which is escaping me. Oh yes, our own predispositions. Um, recognizing that they exist. You know, nobody wants to be accused of being biased or prejudiced or any of the is. Nobody wants to not that, but we are. We are a product of our environment. We're a product of how we were raised, who raised us. Um, you know, I don't think none of us are born thinking I'm better than that person or I don't like those people or they look funny or, you know, none of us are born that way. We're, we're all taught mm -hmm. through our households, through our media, through, you know, all the external stuff that goes on. And so we all have those things. We all, how many people, how many times, you know, I'm sure that um, when I don't look like this, when I'm out shopping in jeans and sweatshirt or no makeup on or something that, <clears throat> I've been treated a certain way, and for some reason, if they, if they find out, if somebody comes to me and say, you know, hi, Justice Stewart, or hi, Judge Stewart, then I'm treated differently. And I don't like that. Mm. Most of the time when I go anywhere, I never use my title, because my title is not significant unless I am working, unless I'm in an area doing something like this that you know who I am, and I'm here because of who I am. But when I am out as just me and my person, somebody says, what do you do? I say, I work for the state of Ohio. <laughs> because I shouldn't be treated any differently than you should be treated or, or, or anyone should be treated. In, in your mm -hmm. health care, um, when you're being uh, um, for some service um, situation. So just recognize that they exist and recognize that those initial gut reactions may not be accurate, they may be based on implicit biases. And, and do what you can at least to recognize that. It might change your perspective, it might not. But I think the number one thing to try to help combat those is recognition. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Yep, you're on now. Um, thank you again. I am a Cameroonian, 
And I'm, um, I'm, on, I'm a permanent resident. Yes. Thank God to the Mandel scholar, uh, scholar, I am able to understand my leadership position where I mentors um, people back in back home. But I come from a country where the president has been in power forever. And it's like um, the old rule, the, um, um, the old never want to die, but they want to die in power. But the youth are always um, going down from they don't they can't achieve their their, their uh -huh. goals. Uh -huh. I've been in this country and I've learned from the Mandel. Mandel is making me go back and think about how I can help the people back there. And the kind of situations I get back is so deploring. Uh, I mean, it makes you come to tears. But Mandel is always there to help out, and they have made me to understand that you can still be a leader even if you're not in the country, and That's you can okay. still uh, mentor people and make them believe in themselves. That's now, okay. as um, someone that is also coming as a Mandel student. Then I'm also I'm about to forget what I'm supposed to do because <laughs> I, at the end of the day I realized that maybe I could do project managing, maybe I could do nursing, maybe I could do I'm still in the midst of like finding out. But now as I want to go back and I still want to go back and still help my country be something better, what would you advise me to do? Like even though I'm a permanent resident, I could stay here forever. But when I took out the little project I'm doing, so many people are so in need that it makes me want to really go back and help out. What would you advise me to do? <clears throat> I advise you to do just what you're doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you bring up a very interesting point. You know, what, what, what comes to your mind when you hear leader and leadership? Is it being on top? Is it bossing people around? Is it making the highest salary? You know, the, my, my, my leadership skills, if you will, have been honed, at least for me, you know, in, starting from high school. Um, um, some of you may know the story, I was pulled aside by what was then called the dean of girls at my school, it was kind of like the vice principal, to run for a student council position, vice president at my school. I'd never run for anything except for the bus to get home and catch it on time. And so I went home and told my mother, you know, mom, you know, sister wants me to run for student council vice president. And I, my mother said, well, that's nice that she asks. Are you going to do it? I says, I don't know. And she said, well, think about it. Got up the next morning. She said, so are you going to do it? And I said, no. And she was kind of disappointed about that. I says, I think I'll run for student council president. <laughs> and so I ran for president, and I won. And that, again, you plant those seeds. That was the first office I ran for, and I was the first African-American female to be student council president in my high school, too. So maybe that was a foreshadow of things to come. Um, but it was, it was a cert my leadership um, um, mantra has been servant leadership. I don't need to, you know, there's some, I know some leaders are like, if I don't lead the band, I'm not going to play in it. I don't need that. I, you know, so my mantra of service le servant leadership is to do whatever, serve the people where they are and at their need. <clears throat> it may be a title, it may not be. You might have a chair with arms on it, you may not. You might not even have a chair. And so I think just staying to tune to either in your country or while you're here, developing the skills in this program, because you're obviously not just learning the things in the, in the books or online or, or, or theories and, and that you're actually, you're learning a skill set to move something forward, be it a country, a community, an organization. Well, I, I praise you for keeping the high ground. Um, you know, hopefully other politicians can kind of take your, your model on mm -hmm. how you handle that, you know, in the future. And so. I always tell people I'm not a politician, but, but I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> but we, 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 we conflate politician and elected official. I know that, but oh, I don't like being called a politician. Last question. Hi, it's a, it's actually a really honor. It's a real honor meeting you Thank again. You, um, I'm Russell. My name is Russell Brower. I'm part of uh, active member of Black American Council. I'm also president of our student government here at the Eastern Campus and also president of Joint Student Council. Oh, good. Um, as a student leader, I do know under, I do understand that I have to lead by example. Mm -hmm. um, based on your knowledge and your past. Um, uh, you know, knowledge or experiences. How do you uh, suggest that, you know, I, as a student leader, I can help with social stigmas in our society today? And when I say social stigmas, I mean like people are looked down on or mm -hmm. look differently mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, obviously because of race or illness or disadvantage. Uh, basically, basically what I mean is how do I, how do we 
help uh, get over some of these barriers. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does make sense. And and I have to say, <clears throat> for you as a as a young man of color, um, you you probably even have a, a, a larger hurdle, particularly uh, as an African American man in in our country. And and you bring up ex excellent points. Here you are getting your education, you've, you've taken on st student leadership roles, and you know outside of these walls things are different when you're out there. And so part of what you need to do is educate. Prime example, let's say you're driving down the street and you get stopped by a police officer. <laughs> Don't say every day, that's scary. But I know it's happened. I'm, I'm not remotely surprised that it has happened to you. And so. And, and this whole thing with, and that's another, that's another point of, uh, which is a whole other discussion for another day, you know, law enforcement in the African American community. When I ran for, for election to the Supreme Court, I got endorsed, and to the total dismay and shock of my entire staff, by the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police. And when I sat in that room, there were 12 to 14 white males with gray hair interviewing me and me sitting in the middle and them grilling me on things. I got endorsed by them and I had a conversation with them about policing in the African American community. And it needs to be education on both sides. In our community, we have to realize that the men and women of law enforcement, and, and they are primarily men and they're primarily white men um, in most communities, are human beings and people too. They want to go back home at the end of the day to their families outside of the shield and the gun. You know, they like watching sports. They like eating pizza. It's, you know, they are human beings. And they likewise have to remember that everybody they encounter, particularly who look like you, is not in a gang and is not a thug and is not a threat to them. And once you meet with that mutual respect, things always go so much better. I tell my young African American um, male, you know, my nephews that, you know, and my nieces, but primarily nephews, if you're stopped, you know, be respectful. And you got to put your mindset in the mindset of a police officer, too. He, he, you don't know him. He doesn't know you. And so when he's approaching the vehicle, you've got to recognize, I really can't do anything. You're just saying, oh, I'm just going to get my, my, going in my wallet to get my, or going in my pocket to get my wallet. You can't do that because that officer doesn't know whether you're going to get a gun. If he or she's got to make a split second decision, you're probably going to lose out on that decision. So it is your responsibility if that happens to be respectful. And, and it's, not being, it's, not, it's not cowing down to. It's, you know, answering the officer with respect and in turn, you will see that respect turn toward you. And if it's a speeding ticket and you were speeding, you might get a warning, you know, as opposed to a ticket. Or, and, 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 but there are young people who want to assert their rights or their authority. And then they, what would have been maybe a speeding ticket that you got a, a warning for ends up being, you know, failure to yield, speeding, not having driver's license, license plate being crooked. I mean, they'll just pile it on. And you might get out of them in court, but you still got to go to court and you still got to fight it and you still got fines. And so you don't win in that scenario. So when you're out, it's how you carry yourself, not only behind these walls, it's how you talk to your friends and you, and you make them realize that we work so much better together. Together. And, and, and police officers, quite frankly, are afraid. They are afraid, just as I think you and I would be, too. And, and we're fearful. I mean, you know, when, when I see lights go, I've got to tell you, I, recently I was stopped by a police officer for allegedly speeding. Um, and, and so, and I did the weirdest thing. I, I, instead of pulling over to the side, I, because of the narrow street, I pulled up in a driveway and then pulled on the other side because there was no parking on this side. That's a no-no. When a police officer stops you and some people are nodding your head, you pull right over to where, but I'm not in the habit of getting stopped by police officers. So you know what? So I got in her driveway, turned over, and was on the proper side of the street. He got off the, got out of the car and said, ma'am, why did you just do that? And I said, you know, I don't know. I think it's because we were on the wrong side of the street. And he said, ma'am, when, when the police officer stops you, you pull over right where you are. You don't do, he said, people flee the police. I didn't know what you were doing. I didn't, <laughs> you know, and true. Now, so, you know, did he know who I was? Of course he did not know who I was. And let me tell you this, there's nothing that's in me that's gonna say who I am. One, because that's not who I am as a person. Two, there is a code of judicial conduct that says if any judge or justice uses their position for gain, you can be sanctioned. 
So, you know, I, I can't whip out the justice card and say, look, officer, this is who I am, you know. <laughs> you, know, you, you, know you know, that one, I could lose my job doing that. And two, you know, that's just, and that's not how it should be. I was a citizen. He was to treat me with respect. And so I said to him, you know, I, I know as he's straightening out his body cam to get my face. And I said, you know, I don't know why I did that, but the only thing I could figure is so I could be on the right side of the street, not even thinking. I mean, hear me, thinking, J judge, judge, not even thinking that he would think, she could be getting ready. He said, I didn't know whether you were going up into the house, whether you were getting a, he didn't know what I was doing. So I think we have to swap places with people often and recognize how they're looking at us and they have to recognize how we're looking at them. And I think you just need to do that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Honey.